Hey everyone, I am sorry that I haven't been in school, but I have a sore throat and my nose is a little runny and I've had a headache. So just to be safe, uh, we think it's probably a cold, but just to be safe, I am staying out to keep you all safe from my germs. Um, I did get a COVID test. It has not come back yet. The results have not come back yet. So hopefully I will be back with you soon as soon as I get my results. But what I wanted to do was just go over the Beowulf questions because I didn't want to leave it too long. So I figured I would go over the part four Beowulf questions here in this video. And then if anybody still had some questions, then they could ask me, you know, via email or over the LMS. So we'll start with number one, which was what qualities does Beowulf show in line 620 to 621? And so that's when Beowulf, you know, he's getting ready to go fight the dragon and nobody else will go with him really. And so he says, I've never known fear. As a youth, I fought in endless battles. I am old now, but I will fight again. Seek fame still if the dragon hiding in his tower dares to face me. And so he shows boastfulness there he shows pride, right? Um, he shows bravery, even though he's old, he's willing to go and still fight against the dragon. Um, he is willing to try and defeat this creature that's been plaguing his people, right? So he shows he's a good king. Um, he's willing to sacrifice himself again for others, which we've seen throughout, but he also wants fame and glory, right? That's something that we've seen him want earlier as well, including when he went after Grendel's mother. And so these are all things, these are all qualities that Beowulf himself shows, again, even in his quite elderly age. Um, the second one, he uses, you know, before when he fought with Grendel, he, you know, fought with his bare hands. You know, he was young, he was strong. Um, now he's older, but also, of course, dragons breathe fire. And so the fact that the dragon breathes fire, um, he's going to need himself a little extra, you know, something to help defeat the dragon. And so he will use his sword, he will use his shield, he will use his helmet, right? He'll have these protective um, things so that he, he can, you know, avoid not just immediately getting burned to death, uh, which, you know, would happen if you're going up against a fire breathing dragon. So for number three, um, this was a really long section, but this is what happens when he encounters the dragon, right? He, you know, it's when he goes and he makes a lot of noise. So the dragon wakes up and comes out of his cave and then the dragon breathes fire on him and melts his helmet. And then um, Beowulf tries to strap, stab the dragon with his sword, but that's when his sword breaks off right in the scales. And so we have some struggles, right? This is the first time in his life that Beowulf has struggled. And when we read this together, we did talk about this, um, how, you know, even though he shows bravery and he does the best he can, he is struggling here. And it's, it's really the first time he's ever had to struggle because he is super strong, right? He has that super strength. Um, and he is so brave and everything else. So this is the first time we see him in danger of dying, right? It's the first time he's had the, the real fear of death, the real thought that he, this might be the end for him. Um, and so that's what happens. And then um, he, yeah, after his sword gets broken off, the dragon breathes fire at him and covers him. He's surrounded completely by flames, right? It says, um, it says, the dragon leaped with pain, thrashed and beat at him, spouting murderous flames, spreading them everywhere. Um, and so he's like breathing fire all over the place. And so that summarizes those bits. Um, and Wiglaf, okay, all the other men run away, right? Nobody wants to help Beowulf. They all run. They're all scared, which, you know, honestly, can't blame them. Dragon fire sounds awful. Um, I don't want to die in burning flames. And so I possibly would have run as well. But Wiglaf thinks back, right? He thinks about all that Beowulf has done for him and his family. They got their land from Beowulf. They have a lot of gold and other things they've gotten from Beowulf. Um, Beowulf is his cousin, right? It mentions, you know, he remembering everything his lord and cousin had given him, armor and gold and the great estates Wexton's family enjoyed, right? Right? And so we have family loyalty here. We also have loyalty to one's king. We also have gratitude, right, for everything that um, Beowulf has done for him and his family. And so we have a lot of qualities here that sort of help Wiglaf find the courage, right? It also takes a great deal of courage to stand when everybody else is running away. And so all of these things we see Wiglaf exhibiting when he stays and helps Beowulf defeat the dragon. And of course, Wiglaf is in the end able to kill the dragon, um, although Beowulf, of course, is now at the end of his life. Oh, 
So after, right, after the dragon is dead, we have, you know, Beowulf, you know, lingering. Um, and there's this moment in line 810. I had asked about Christian influences in lines 810 to 818. And there's this moment where Wiglaf sprinkles water on him. Um, and to me that, you know, is, is, of course, we think of baptism, right, with sprinkling of water. But I also thought some sort of last rites, right, this sort of um, ceremonial praying over someone who is dying, sprinkling them with water. So we get a sense sort of of last rites from um, we laugh here that he's doing this as Beowulf is dying. He also prays, right? Our father in heaven, ruler of the earth. Um, you know, and so he, he does all of this as well. Um, well, that's, sorry, that's Beowulf. Beowulf does, is the one who prays. So Wiglaf sprinkles him with water. Beowulf says the prayer. Um, so I asked you for number six, what Beowulf's dying wish is, and it's really a two-part wish. Um, he wishes, first of all, for Wiglaf to lead his people. And so he says, take care of my people, lead them after I am gone. And so in a way, he sort of like anoints Wiglaf king. That's um, his one of his dying wishes. But the big one is that the people built him a tomb, right? Build a tomb high on the cliffs where you can see it from the ocean, and they'll remember me. And they'll talk about, you know, the great deeds that I have done. And so he's concerned for his legacy, right? He wants to be remembered. He wants it to be a positive thing, right? And he wants it to be something that people will notice. And so he is concerned, you know, for his, for his future, even, even after his death, he wants to think about how his legacy will continue on, um, without him. So there's that. And then in the farewell, which is the last part after he died, right? I asked, what do the men include in his tomb? So they build the tomb. It's a tall tower. They call it Beowulf Tower. But they also put all of the gold and treasure that they had taken from the dragon's lair, right? And so instead of distributing it among the people, instead of Wiglaf just keeping it all for himself, right? They actually put it in the tomb. And that shows that for them, honoring Beowulf was more important than money, right? The, you know, these material belongings would have been great, but it was more important to them to include them in Beowulf's tomb to show their honor for him and that he, you know, he deserves all of this treasure for ruling as he did for so many years and for doing so many great things as a ruler um, and for all of the great, you know, monsters that he had defeated in the past. And so this is their way of honoring him. Again, showing loyalty, right? We see loyalty again and again um, being brought up in this epic, that this is something that they really treasure, this desire to honor those who you look up to, to honor those people who are either related to you or who are your leaders, um, who are your kinsmen, or who are from your nation, right, to honor your nation. And so this is something that they show a great deal of pride in and show a great deal of value of. And then... What else do they do to honor him? I, you know, we have them riding around the tomb in a circle on their horses, telling stories of him, right? That's a um, something that people have done, you know, again, going back, you know, centuries and centuries, right? This oral tradition, this telling of stories, this sharing of good deeds. And so we have them doing that as well. Um, you know, 12 of the bravest Geats rode their horses around the tower, telling their sorrow, telling stories of their dead king and his greatness, his glory, praising him for heroic deeds, excuse me, for a life as noble as his name. Um, and they're mourning their, their leader and crying. Um, and so they basically, you know, are doing all of this to honor him in his death and show that their, their love for him and their honor for him and their loyalty, right? Again, so this idea of loyalty. Um, I had two final questions, and one of them was traits that are valued, which I sort of just covered, right? The, this idea of courage and loyalty, um, not caring so much about material things, right? We saw it earlier, too, when Beowulf went into Grendel's lair and killed Grendel's mother and brought back Grendel's head. He left all the treasure down there, right? Showing, um, again, that it's not necessarily this gold, it's not necessarily these riches that are valued. It's the traits of courage, of loyalty, of um, honor, of kinship, right? Of, you know, these really sort of noble traits that people have 
rather than materialistic concerns. Um, the last question is about today, right? Connect this idea of heroes and sacrificing one's life and all of this, um, you know, getting glory in war. Um, you know, I could tell you my thoughts on it, but I think I'll save it and we can talk about it next week after we present our projects, right? So we'll save that last question um, about connections to today and, and our values in society versus the way they valued society um, in, Beowulf's time, right, in, in the time of this, the, when, when this epic was written, and we will talk about that then. So remember your projects are due Monday. Uh, remember Alpha, bring your projects to school with you. Uh, if it's something like an essay or a short story, right, or, you know, so if you did the fictional, if it's typed, if it's a typed story of that, of that nature, you can just attach it to the LMS. There's a place to attach it. If it's a comic book or a storybook or a painting, you'll have to bring that in, bring that in so I can see the hard copy of it. And for Bravo cohort, you will need to photograph and send in your project. So if you did the comic book, make sure you take a picture of every page, right? And send in those pictures. If you did a painting, send me a picture of your painting. If you did an essay or a, or a, st a story, again, attach those um, as, you know, a Google Doc. And I will hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.